What is up, everyone? Today, boom, The Black Company by Glenn Cook, and I'll be reviewing the first three books, which this is a three-in-one edition of The Black Company, Shadows Linger, and The White Rose. So just like this book being three-in-one, my review will be three-in-one. How awesome is that? Uh, first, I'm just going to give some general thoughts on these first three books, then I'm going to talk about the first book, The Black Company, then second book, then third book. And when I'm talking about the second book, there will be spoilers for the first book. And when I'm talking about the third book, there will be spoilers for the first two books. So just keep that in mind. So first general thoughts. So first thing about the series, we've got a very grim dark world. So if you don't like grim dark, this probably isn't for you. And then we follow around a band of mercenaries, and the band of mercenaries is called the Black Company, as you might have guessed. And Glenn Cook himself was a Vietnam War veteran, so he kind of wanted the soldier's perspective and kind of sh to show like the dark sides of war. And in this series, we follow around Croker, who is the medic and analyst for the Black Company. So he kind of like chronicles everything, and you're basically reading his perspectives. You're, you're like reading literally the chronicles of the Black Company. So it's definitely a little bit tough early on to get into the world because, again, Croker's perspective, and he's writing in such a way where he assumes the reader of what he's writing will be like a future Black Company member, so he's assuming they know, like, basic things about, like, the world, the magic system, the Black Company itself as an organization. So for me, that was a bit tough uh, to really get into it. And there was, like, a Wikipedia page that just describes, like, various aspects in the world. And I remember, like, having to look at that, and I'm like, oh, this is helpful. And it's for that reason I definitely liked the first one the least by quite a m big margin. And then the second one I liked the most. And then the third one I liked quite a bit. So if you're coming to this video having read the first one, but you haven't read the second one because you didn't like the first one, I would just read the second one, especially if you're a character-driven reader. Because Croker is solid. His development throughout the series is great. He goes from like just like a character that I'm kind of meh about in the first book to a character that I'm like really loving and is sticking in my brain after reading the first three. And then book two has like other character development as well. And if you're like me and have the addition with the three books, you already have the second book as well, so you might as well give it a go. And then if you don't like book two, then there's probably no hope for you liking this series. So you have my full permission to stop reading this series if you don't like book two of the series. Okay, now let's talk about the theme of the Black Company. I thought it was pretty interesting. This is kind of like uh, one of the first, if not the first, grimdark series. And, you know, there's the strong theme in this series of good versus evil. What is bad? What is evil? What is too evil? And then there's relativism in terms of, you know, this world. It's so much darker. And things that, like, you or I might find it, like, very objectionable. It's like, well, are we really going to talk about these objectionable things when, you know, there's these other way worse things going on? And there's a lot of, like, lesser of two evils situations. And yeah, I thought that was very interesting, the way that was done, for the most part, at least. I'm not, like, a super grim dark lover, but, like, you know, I like it sometimes. All right, so are you guys ready to talk about The Black Company, book one? So book one has very long chapters, and they take a while to get through. And again, you're like thrown really into the action right away. And we've got Croker, we've got The Black Company, and then we start meeting characters like One-Eye, Goblin, etc. And then there's the captain and the lieutenant of The Black Company, who are just called the captain and the lieutenant. And right away... Um, there's, like, fighting in the city that they're in, and the captain is like, oh, man, this this kind of sucks. Like, this is a very unstable situation. It's hard for us to be mercenaries and make money, and our lives are in danger. We've lost some of our members. Like, this is bad. 
and then they get offered a contract on another continent. So they're like, oh, <laughs> okay, bye. And their new contractor is this character named the Lady, who is like this emperor person, and she's very powerful, and she has magic, and the magic is very not well defined, especially in the first book, but then it gets more fleshed out later on. And the Lady takes a particular interest in Croker. Now, why is this? Well, I don't know. But Croker's kind of captivated by the lady. And we don't really know if it's because of magic or like what exactly is going on. But we definitely read a lot about it because, again, Croker's perspective. So if he's crushing on this all powerful girl boss emperor, that's what he's going to think about. And that's what he's going to write about. So we have to read about it. And I remember I made the joke that I felt like I was reading medieval fanfic in the narrative at some points. So yeah, that was weird. We're also introduced to this character named Raven, and he's like, oh, I'm all brooding, I'm very mysterious, and blah blah blah. And yeah, like I said, the first book was pretty hard for me to get into. Some of the plot stuff was cool, there were some cool battles and big battles and like little skirmishes and stuff like that, and then there's like magic, and I'm always confused about what's going on with the magic, especially early on. But in addition to that, there's like these like more low-key moments. There's times when they're all playing cards and stuff, and Goblin and One-Eye are pranking each other. But yeah, it felt like there was no like meat on the bones of the, this book in a lot of ways. Like, we know that there's the Empire that they're working for and the Lady, and then we know there's a bunch of rebels, but we're following around the perspective of just, like, a regular soldier, so we don't get, like, that higher-up political intrigue and all that stuff that's going on. But I actually think on reread, the first book would be more interesting just because those scenes with those characters that I've grown to love a lot more now like, just the scenes of them playing cards and just hanging out and talking, I think those might be pretty cool to revisit. But in the time, on my first read, like, eh, didn't really like it. This was, like, two and a half or two stars, I don't know. It, it like, eh, eh, eh. But if you suffered through the first book, definitely pick up the second book. Because, oh man, book two, so much better. Shadows linger book two. Oh man this is where the fun begins so we get a different perspective in this book and it's this guy named marin shed who is in the middle of nowhere in this little tiny town called juniper on the edge of the ocean on the north east coast northwest coast i can't even remember but the lady's like yeah you guys should go to that like pointless town so, Croker and them go all the way over there. Now, Marin Shed owns this rundown tavern. He has family that are financially dependent on him, and he's had to take out some loans and, like, these loan sharks. Damn, these loan sharks. They're not good people. And he has this dude who works for him named Asa. This dude sucks. He's pointless. By that, I don't mean, like, he's a bad character or anything. I mean, like, man, if this guy or someone I worked with, I would hate to work with him. Uh, no, he's just like a sniveling coward. But I mean that, like, in a good way, <laughs> like, as a character. So yeah, they're all in this little town in the middle of nowhere called Juniper. The ladies having Croker and them determine what's going on with the Dominator, and, like, if the Dominator's gonna reemerge in this area over here. And this tavern owner's trying to not lose his tavern. Oh, and also, this is where Raven and Darling went, because it's the edge of the world in the middle of nowhere, and Raven didn't think that anyone would find him, or Darling. And yeah, we really get to know, like, this town. It's like fantasy Gilmore Girls. It's like, you know, everyone in, you know, Stars Hollow and the Gilmore Girls, and then you just know everyone in Juniper in this. And it's so fun. I just love all the characters in here. And, like, Croker's a better character. His writing, like shows the world around him better i think and you know you get to know like one eye and goblin more and raven he goes from this kind of like stereotypical badass to like a more well fleshed out character someone who maybe like opens up a bit more now that he's not surrounded by a ton of people that he doesn't trust 
And oh yeah, we learned at the end of the last book that Darling is the White Rose, so this is pretty important. And Croker knows that, and Raven knows that, and I don't think anyone else knows that. So yeah, that's very cool, and definitely means that they don't want Raven to be captured, because then Darling would be captured as well. So they, of course, have to like hide or flee or something. But yeah, then in them investigating what the Dominator is doing is very interesting, because there's like a temple thing to the dominator i forget if he was buried up here but yeah there's like this place and it's like fenced off and no one goes in no one goes out but yeah that's why the black company is there to try to figure out what's going on and oh yeah marin shed let's talk about him marin shed is like a horrible person but he is one of like the most maybe relatable objectively horrible people that maybe i've ever read if he kills someone, I laugh. Like, like I don't know. Does that make me insane? Maybe. But yeah, I don't know. It's just like a great grim dark character. He he might be the best grim dark character I've ever read. I don't know. Him or Glockta, one or the other. They're a bit different though. Glockta's more embedded in a system of just horrible atrocities, and Glockta, of course, is from the First Law series. But in here, Marin Shed, he's more corrupted by his individual needs and desires and he knows he's doing the wrong thing but he like can't help it and he might not even be like the worst person that lives in the town it's it's just uh, i don't even know it's awesome though i love it yeah this was like a four-star book but there there's two types of four-star books for me there's the ones that i read and i like think about it maybe like a month or two months later and i'm like Uh, four stars that might have been a little generous but shadow linger so good like the more i think about it the more i like it and i i just love the characters like croaker gets better marin shed asa you know raven and darling get better It, it just it's a win all around i didn't think you could have a first book that was as bad as the black company and then have a second book be as good as book two in the black company but then we get to book three and book three definitely was not as good uh, as book two but it didn't have as many problems as the first book had we still kept croaker's writing style being more uh, direct and relatable and understandable to people who are not in the black company we still had like the shorter chapters and stuff But there's a new thing that confused me in this book a bit, or it was a little bit harder to get into for me at least. And that was the new character perspective of Bowman. And his perspective comes much earlier in the timeline than Croker's. And basically he's researching stuff, he's investigating the lady and where she came from and the Dominator. And he's basically trying to figure out, okay, how do we beat these people? And then he's sending letters to Croker that get to Croker much later because of the distance that the messengers have to travel. So yeah, that was a little harder to get into, but once I got into it, it was a bit, you know, easier. And his personal story was a bit less exciting to me as well. Like, Bowman has this wife, and he does not get along with his wife. Classic old bickering couple and not bickering in, like, a good way. And yeah, I I don't know. It was less interesting to me than Marin Shedd, who was just hilarious and just, like, horrible. And this entire story is almost like a investigation more so than the other ones were. Although there was, like, investigation elements of the second book as well. But this one, Croker, is also trying to look through old texts to figure out how to defeat the lady. So yeah, just a bit less exciting of a plot for me. And then the characters were a bit less good, although Croker I grew to really love in this book. And, you know, the rest of the crew as well. And Darling becomes more of a character here, because obviously this takes place a few years later, like five or six years later, so she's an adult now. She's the leader of the rebels, and she's aligned with Croker now, of course. And they're in the, the middle of these totally barren wastelands basically and in these barrow lands there are all sorts of weird creatures we've got this father tree figure and then we've got stones that talk and wind whales which fly around and like other like just awesome imaginary creatures and because this area is so undesirable and so 
you know, no one wants to go there, and the lady doesn't want to go there. And that's why they're taking refuge in the Barrowlands. Also, the magic system starts getting fleshed out a bit better here. We've got Darling Magic, and basically she's got, like, an anti-spell radius around her, where, you know, the lady's powers don't work, Taken don't work, you know, nothing works near Darling magically. And then, like, in terms of One-Eye and Goblin, their magic is more fleshed out in what they can do, It's and they have, like, D&D magic almost. They've got, like, different spells that they know, and they can only use spells a certain amount of times before they have to like take a rest and you know let their spell slots recharge or whatever and yeah we have a more intimate knowledge of you know the sides we because you know croaker and the black company were on the lady side for the last two books so we kind of know the lady and a bunch of the taken and stuff like that and then we get to learn about darling and the rebels and all of them and yeah we there's just like a very bleak outlook for croaker and their backs are against the wall certainly they're not really able to leave the barrow lands because they're surrounded by the lady and her forces so yeah, it just seems like a very desperate book where desperate times call for desperate measures, perhaps, and the ending is interesting. There's definitely set up for future stuff, but to me it was a pretty satisfying ending for the Books of the North, which is the first three books in The Black Company, but then there's like seven books after this. But I feel like this is a pretty good stopping point for now. I don't know if I'm going to get back to this series. Uh, we shall see. I may be craving something like The Black Company and this sort of grim, dark feel. But yeah, that's everything. Like, comment, subscribe. Subscribing helps me out. I Oh yeah, and I forgot to mention this, but I hit 500 subscribers. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to have a live show next weekend, so stay tuned. It should be very fun. And yeah, that was everything. The Black Company. Glenn Cook. Tell me what you thought in the comments below, and see you guys next time.